recording now and I'll start streaming on live. Hello, David. Hello, hello. Hello, Jack. There you go. Eight o'clock exactly. That's eight in Georgia, but it's eleven, Hi, right? David. In Canada. It's twelve. 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 Twelve, twelve okay. noon. All right, we got this one. I just dropped the link to YouTube Live if anyone wants to share it. While we're still getting ready. There we go. Mm -hmm. All right, Brother Bob, if you are ready, we can, we can, I can start the introduction and sure. then we start. Okay. So uh, with your permission, I will now mute everyone and Brother Bob, please unmute yourself. Okay. Should, yeah, yeah, you're fine. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is Sapedia the number 79 today. And we have uh, the topic, Foundation of the Grand Lodge of Scotland, by uh, our uh, beloved brother, Robert uh, Cooper. And uh, we, will, uh, uh, we will discuss uh, the very early days of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. Uh, uh, while in the lecture, we will, uh, I will share with you his personal page where you can find his books. If you still have not uh, searched for uh, for them, um, I will just remind everyone that uh, the meeting is uh, for everyone. It is public. It is being recorded. It is uh, being streamed on YouTube. Uh, we adhere very to very simple rules here. We don't discuss politics, religion, or any interjurisdictional issues. Uh, we do love to learn more about the Freemasonry, its philosophy, historical part, esoterical part, some things around and uh, around and around the Freemasonry. So uh, having said that, it is my pleasure to give floor to brother Robert. I guess he just left for some, yeah, he's here. I'll just remind everyone that every single um, opinion that is being shared here is of individual nature would it be from the speaker uh, from moderator or any participant unless it is emphasized that it is an official opinion um, or stand uh, point of any uh, institution so brother bob as always looking forward for your great lecture and i'll mute now myself okay thank you very much um can everyone see the screen or is it just me I confirm. You can see the, the you can see the title slide. Yes, found in the Grand Lodge on yeah. green dotted. Uh... That's good. That's good. Okay. Well, um, once again, uh, David um, and everyone, uh, thanks very much for um, the invitation 
uh, to add a, a, my tuppence worth, if you like, um, tonight. Um, it's always a pleasure um, to be uh, invited to give these talks, especially when I think um, a lot of people don't really know very much about the history of Scottish Freemasonry. Um, I think most people will know something about the founding of the Grand Lodge of England um, in 1717, although that date, I have to say, is now uh, in considerable doubt, um, given the um, uh, recent uh, research done by Professor Prescott and Dr. Summers, um, who have investigated the origins of the Grand Lodge of England. However, that's uh, probably for another time, um, although their, their findings are um, extremely important in my view from a historical, uh, from a historical point of view, and their impact um, on Freemasonry in Scotland um, is also very important as a consequence um, of that research. Now, um, I've, I've spoken to you quite a few times in the past, I think, um, about the um, pre-Grand Lodge form of Freemasonry that existed here um, in Scotland. We've, we've talked about the early minutes from 1598. Um, we've talked about William Shaw, who was the King's Master of Works from 1583. And we've talked about um, everything that was going on in Scotland during the 17th century, uh, culminating in the old rituals, um, which are superstitious, um, which date from as early as 1696. So a very, a very important um, year, uh, 100 years, uh, a very important century um, in the very early history of Freemasonry. Um, but as I've said before, um, history is very rarely uh, made up of single events that suddenly happen, uh, what we call the, the Big Bang Theory, where you know, at nine o'clock on a Monday morning, Freemasonry was invented. Um, history doesn't work like that. Um, there's always something going on which leads up to a specific event, um, regardless of how trivial or how earth-shattering it might be. There's always something that leads up to it. Now, um, as I say, we've talked about Freemasonry in Scotland um, before um, 1717, before any Grand Lodge existed. And interestingly enough, of the three nations that comprise the United Kingdom, which are Scotland, Ireland, and England, of those three um, countries, uh, Scotland was the last to form a Grand Lodge. Now, that's a bit odd when you think that um, we have more than 100 years of history before any Grand Lodge was founded, um, whereas um, that network of lodges that I've already mentioned from 1598 um, didn't exist in Ireland or in England. So it's a bit odd um, as to why the Grand Lodge of Scotland um, was um, very late in, in the game, if you like. Um, and that's really what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Um, what, uh, why the Grand Lodge of Scotland um, was founded in the first place and why it took them so long to catch up with England um, and Ireland, um, whose Grand Lodge was founded in 1723. So in terms of the Grand Lodge um, of England, we were 19 years um, behind them and we were, uh, uh, um, what, 30, 13 years behind the Grand Lodge of Ireland. So there was a long, that's quite a long time uh, in between the institution of these organizations, but I think we'll be able to explain why as we go along. We're very fortunate, and I've mentioned this before, that Scotland um, uh, seemed to be a very uh, assiduous in uh, keeping Lodge records and Grand Lodge was no different. This is the letter that was sent to all known lodges in Scotland um, on the 10th, oh, sorry, the 20th of October, uh, 1736. So this was an invitation, if you like. Um, the first paragraph reads, I didn't have time to type out for you to read it, but it, it reads, the four lodges in and about Edinburgh having taken into their serious consideration the great loss that masonry has sustained through want of a grand master authorized us to signify to you our good and worthy brethren 
our hearty desire and firm intention to choose a Grand Master for Scotland, and in order that the same may be done with the greatest harmony, we hereby invite you, as we have done to all other regular lodges known to us, to concur in such a great and good work, whereby it's hoped that masonry will be restored to its ancient luster in this kingdom. Um, and then it goes on, um, as for effecting um, of this laudable design, we humbly desire that between now and Martimus Day next, you will be pleased to give us a brotherly answer in relation to the election of a Grand Master, which we suppose to be on St Andrew's Day for the first time, and ever thereafter to be on St John the Baptist Day, or as the Grand Lodge shall appoint um, with the majority of voices which are to be collected from the Master and Wardens, of all regular lodges then present or by proxy um, of um, the other lodges. So it's a fairly wordy uh, letter, that's not at all, you can read the rest of it, uh, especially as it's being recorded. But there's a very, very uh, interesting number of points in that uh, very simple letter. Um, first thing, of course, is that it's actually sent to all known lodges known by the people who sent the letter. And you can see um, the signatures and their, um, and, and their lodges uh, towards the end. So you've got George uh, uh, Fraser of Lodge Canning Gate Co-Winning, Home. important I think to note the order um, of the signatures in the letter because the very first one is Canning Gate Co-Winning but that is by no means the oldest lodge involved. The oldest lodge involved is Mary's Chapel which as I mentioned before their minutes begin in 1599 and are continuous uh, to the present day. So the, the, that tells us one thing right away that it was this lodge that is the powerhouse. Uh, it's the one that's taking the leading role in the formation of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. And the other three lodges um, seem to have been added in. Now, there's a very good reason um, why there was only four lodges involved. And no doubt, uh, hopefully after the talk, um, we'll get some questions that will tease out some more of the kind of more interesting little nuances. So. Um, what happened was, uh, as you can see, the letter invites everyone, all the known lodges, to come to this room, to come to this building um, that you can see. Uh, this is the premises of Lodge Canongate Co-Winning, number two, as it's called now. And this is the oldest purpose-built lodge room in the world. It was built in 1735, and it's still, uh, the lodge still meets there to this day. Uh, so it's, it's probably the only lodge, I, I think, that has never actually moved premises um, in, in almost 300 years. Um, this is where all the lodges came together for the inaugural meeting on the 30th of November. But it was also where um, the four lodges got together to lay out their plans or their intentions for the um, for the new Grand Lodge. And indeed, this is where William St. Clair of Roslyn um, actually became the master of the lodge. Um, just to make a quick mention of the painting, it's a very famous painting. It hangs in the Museum of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. Um, it's uh, painted quite a long time after the events of 1736, but the room itself remains virtually unchanged to this very day. Um, you can see William St. Clair's uh, portrait um, on the right hand side back wall. Um, and you know, the, the, there's the famous organ and all the rest of it. There's a full lecture that goes with uh, explaining this painting, but that's not the purpose of that um, here tonight. It's just to let you see um, a room that is relatively small, um, but um, laid out for uh, Scottish Freemasonry, um, as I say, almost 300 years ago. Um, 
and as I, as, I've, as it says there, it's the oldest purpose-built lodge room in the world. Um, if every lodge had turned up um, with three representative, because you'll notice that the letter talks about the master and wardens, so that would be three from each lodge, so 300 people. Um, frankly, 300 people would have a great deal of difficulty fitting into this room. A hundred is probably about as many as could be expected. A hundred, perhaps a few more. Um, if it was standing room only, you would probably get a few more in, but sitting down, a um, hundred would be probably the maximum. So um, this was where all the events leading up to the formation of the Grand Lodge of Scotland took place. And this was also the place where the inaugural meeting was held. Before we move on, let's take a little look at the very first uh, Grand Master. Um, how he became Grand Master is also extremely interesting. Um, but William St. Clair of Roslyn, he was not an aristocrat. Um, he was um, a, la a substantial landowner, so he would have been a, a, a laird, um, but he wasn't, um, he wasn't even a knight. He wasn't a sir. He wasn't, a, wasn't Sir William St. Clair of Roslyn. He was just William St. Clair of Roslyn. So he was a, a landowner uh, in the vicinity of Edinburgh. And as you know, Roslyn Chapel is about seven or eight miles uh, south of Edinburgh. Um, so not far for, for him to travel really uh, into the city. Um, but he is, very, he is a very important person for his uh, activities. He was um, very well known as a golfer. And of course, as we know, golf was invented in Scotland, just like Freemasonry. Um, so it, it's very important that he um, was a, a golfer because um, the rules of golf, and I know I'm digressing a little bit, but I'm remembering things. The rules of golf were laid down in Scotland by the first golf clubs, um, which were um, mainly um, uh, staffed or uh, the membership of these golf clubs were nearly all Freemasons, uh, Scottish Freemasons. And interestingly enough, the early uh, rules and regulations um, of golf clubs are very Masonic in, con in content. Um, but again, <laughs> yet, yet, another, yet another discussion, I think, uh, for, for another time. He was also very important in terms of his position within the social structure, certainly of Edinburgh and therefore in terms of Scotland. He was a member of the Royal Company of Archers which, uh, as you can see, is the king or queen's bodyguard uh, when they are in Scotland. And a uh, very important uh, position, very uh, ceremonial position, to be honest. But very interestingly, um, uh, still, uh, still exists, still um, um, dresses in the same uniform. And uh, you see them, uh, they have various ceremonial duties at different times of the year. So again, if you're ever going to come to Scotland, check on when um, uh, they're uh, holding a, or they're participating in events when the King or Queen um, is here. They have a, quite a nice website, if I remember rightly. They've got a very interesting picture of uh, William St. Clair um, uh, playing golf. Um, for those who are interested in Roslyn Chapel, you'll notice in the last comment, is that when he died in 1778, I think it was in January 1778, he was um, buried with full Masonic honours in the crypt of Roslyn Chapel um, and later given a funeral lodge by the Grand Lodge of Scotland. So one of the first, if not the first funeral lodge or um, yeah, it would be a funeral, well, not, not a funeral lodge in the modern sense, but perhaps a lodge of mourning might be a better a better title. So um, let me think, I'm just, I don't want to miss um, anything out. So yes, what happened was um, the three um, people who were uh, proposed, and this is very important and it's, in my opinion, it's crucial for understanding the nature of Scottish Freemasonry. One of the things that these early minute books tell us is that um, the master and wardens and virtually every other office bearer in, in a Scottish lodge had to be nominated and seconded and elected 
by the members of the lodge. And we know this because the minute books um, of, of Scottish lodges from um, 1598 onwards um, include details of the actual elections. And some of these elections were very fiercely contested. And we have, uh, in some lodges, we have, it's clearly um, uh, a very prestigious thing to become master of the lodge. And so we have, at least in one instance I can remember, we have an instance where somebody stood as master of the lodge, he was defeated, so he stood as senior warden of the lodge and he was defeated in that. So he stood as junior warden of the lodge, he was defeated in that. So he stood as senior deacon. So you get the, you get the picture, you know, um, whoever that guy was, I can't remember his name, he was desperate to have a, a senior position within the lodge. Um, but it's all down to the votes of the brethren. This is the same um, procedure that applies today. Um, uh, this democratic process uh, has to take place uh, at lodge level, but also at provincial or district level, and, and also at the Grand Lodge of Scotland level. So here we have, because of that letter being sent out, um, these are three people who were nominated um, to be Grand Master. So there is to be an election uh, between these, of these three individuals. And you'll see, of course, William St. Clair is there. He is not uh, particularly important, shall we say, in terms of uh, position in the aristocracy. You have the eighth Earl of Home, um, who was uh, obviously a very senior individual, and he was uh, a master um, of uh, um, winning Scots Arms, uh, and he had the support of um, what four, five lodges. The Earl of Crawford was probably the guy who was going to get the job because he'd already been a Grand Master a couple of years before, in 1734. But something happened that uh, affected the decision on that night. Before we go on to exactly what happened, let's talk about the meeting, what happened at the meeting. We've seen that 100 lodges were invited, 100 more or more lodges were invited, but only 33 actually sent in representatives, either the master and the wardens or the appointed proxies, quite often from other lodges in the Edinburgh area, especially from lodges in the far north. Um, of the 33, um, 12 who listened to what was going on and decided that no, it wasn't for them, and they left. So 21 lodges um, were left to support uh, or to implement the idea of a Grand Lodge. Um, so in other words, 21% of all the Scottish lodges thought a Grand Lodge was a good idea, but 79% didn't. So the Grand Lodge of Scotland was off to a very, very shaky start. Um, you know, 79% of all the lodges in Scotland weren't interested in a Grand Lodge. Of, in a Grand Lodge. So just to let you see the 33 lodges that actually attended, here you are, and you'll see that um, some of the oldest and most prominent lodges are named, like Mary's Chapel, Mother Kilwinning, of course, Canongate Kilwinning, the driving force um, behind um, uh, the, the formation of the Grand Lodge, and then all sorts of other ones. Um, they are not in any particular order. This is the order that they were recorded um, as attending the meeting. Um, and you know, so they're not in alphabetical order, nor in the nor are they um, in um, uh, in terms of uh, antiquity. And that, of course, was going to cause trouble later. Um, um, because Mary's Chapel, as shown in that list, is actually uh, shown as being the first lodge uh, on the roll. And we can perhaps talk a little bit about that um, later. Um, so um, back to uh, the election. Let me just quickly see where we are. Yeah. Um, back to the election of, of William, William St. Clair of Roslyn. Um, what happened was that before the election was actually held at the meeting, um, William St. Clair of Roslyn stood up and uh, read 
a declaration um, of uh, um, renunciation, a declaration of renunciation, uh, which renounced, and I think the wording was, um, I, William St. Clair of Roslyn, hereby renounce all responsibilities and privileges as um, master of the Scottish craft. Um, some words to that effect. So in other words, he stood up and he said, because my family um, have long been the leaders of the Scottish Masons, um, I hereby renounce all privileges and uh, titles and responsibilities relating to that. And of course, he, he presented it in such a way that there was no need for an election. He was elected, as they say, by acclamation. Um, he was elected by popular applause, in other words. And so there was never an election held um, for the first Grand Master Mason. So neither Holm nor Crawford um, got, an elect you know, got an elected position at that time. William St. Clair of Roslyn became the first Grand Master Mason of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. And so I think we can see from that that the organisers um, of, the, of the whole event um, had um, really arranged things to get the one guy that they wanted a master of their lodge, the one guy that they wanted as Grand Master, and they, they hatched this plan, which worked. Um, they hatched this plan to get him elected, um, although no election took place, as I say, he was elected by acclamation. So here you have a situation where the people who are, are driving this Lodge Canongate co-winning um, want their man, uh, William St. Clair of Roslyn, and they make arrangements to make sure that he is elected, which he is. Now, I mentioned before, um, there's a hundred lodges, only 33 attended. So some of the lodges that didn't attend, and here's some of them, just to give you an idea, with their dates, uh, the dates that they, that they were founded, some of these lodges just weren't interested in forming the Grand Lodge of Scotland. Now, this was a real problem, not only for William St. Clair, but also for the new Grand Lodge, because some of these lodges, as you can see, were very old indeed, and therefore, with their antiquity, um, brought legitimacy. So the new Grand Lodge wanted the legitimacy of having all these old lodges under their wing. You know, they wanted all the lodges in Scotland to be part of this new Masonic body called the Grand Lodge. Um, but these lodges, and these are just the, the first few, there obviously was a lot more, but these are the first few that didn't even bother attending um, the, the inaugural meeting uh, on the 30th of November, um, 1736. Um, and you can see from that list, some of them uh, are extremely old. Uh, Melrose and John, uh, as old as uh, uh, Lodge Mary's Chapel, number one, um, from the same year, 1599. And quite a few from not ju just a few years later than that, right up until some that were um, up to the very point um, of the formation of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. So this is a problem for Grand Lodge. Um, we have um, 21 lodges that are supporting it and 79 that do not. And this makes the Grand Lodge of Scotland appear, well, not weak, but not, uh, not exactly um, in charge of the Scottish situation. And this is very different from what happened in England, where four lodges, or perhaps six, but we'll say four, um, founded the Grand Lodge of England. This was a very, very different situation here in Scotland with over a hundred lodges. And of course, with that sheer number of um, people to deal with, you know, even just the, the representatives, the master and the wardens, um, that sheer number made the administration, the arrangements for the, for the new Grand Lodge incredibly uh, complex in comparison to dealing with just four, four lodges uh, in the immediate area of, of London where the Grand Lodge was founded. 
Uh, in Scotland, this was a national network uh, from the far north to the far south and covering all, all, all types of lodges. So although many of them were operative and many of the ones that are shown on this lodge um, were operative, like Melrose St. John, it was an operative lodge. Some of them were not, some of them were um, very much um, um, speculative lodges. Uh, so the Grand Lodge of Scotland had a problem. And I think this, this, this is the crux of the difficulty. Um, the operative lodges um, in Scotland um, were interested to the point of some of them uh, asking, well, what's the Grand Lodge for? And they went along um, to the inaugural meeting and no doubt questions were asked. Um, people um, were asking questions such as, well, we're an operative lodge, we're all stonemasons here, um, what's the Grand Lodge going to do for us? Are they going to get us contracts to build things? Are they going to speak on our behalf to the church, um, to the aristocracy? So the church for building churches, the aristocracy for building houses and palaces and castles. Are you going to speak to um, anyone else that needs a building erected? Are you going to find us work, in other words? And of course, the answer was no. Um, the Grand Lodge of Scotland was an entirely speculative body, really only interested in ritual and ceremonial. They were not interested whatsoever in um, the operative side of masonry in Scotland. And that, I think, is the crux of why so many um, lodges in Scotland wanted nothing to do with this newfangled Grand Lodge that wasn't actually going to do anything um, for for them as ordinary working men. They saw no point. They were managing as independent lodges at a local level. There was no need for a head office, especially a head office that wasn't actually going to do very much. And no doubt, in addition to that, there would have been a great fear on the part of these lodges that a grand lodge was going to start interfering with what they did locally um, and they would perhaps start to impose rules and regulations that the Lodge didn't agree with, but if they were part of Grand Lodge, would be forced to accept. So there was a lot of hesitation about joining um, the Grand Lodge of Scotland for these very reasons. And it's these reasons that mean that Scottish Freemasonry today is very different from the Freemasonry that exists anywhere else in the world. And this is simply because in order to get these lodges that you can see here from Melrose St. John uh, down, um, in order to try, and I say the word try, to get all these lodges on board, they decided that they would have to um, uh, change their approach, uh, certainly different from the way the Grand Lodge of England had done it. Um, they would they would concede, um, and I, I mean I use that word advisedly because they couldn't concede anything they didn't already have. They decided to explain that might be a better word to all the lodges um, in Scotland that they were not going to interfere in local lodge custom and practice. So in other words, in, a, in an attempt to get these lodges on board, they were saying to them, look we're not going to interfere in what you have been doing um, as independent lodges that existed before the Grand Lodge of Scotland came into being. Now, that's a problem because one, certainly in Scotland it was a problem because if you say to lodges that existed before 1736, we're not going to interfere with what, how you do things, then Every lodge that's founded after 1736 wants exactly the same amount of independence as those lodges which were already in existence. And you can see why. It would have created two types or two categories of lodges. Lodge, Pre-Grand Lodge lodges and post-Grand Lodge lodges. One with a lot of in, ones with a lot of independence and one being uh, told what to do 
by the Grand Lodge, and that certainly wasn't going to wash. So having having given um, the local lodges, you know, all all these lodges that were present at the inaugural meeting, having given these lodges um, a promise that they would not interfere um, in all um, in all their work in all their uh, way of doing things um, from the far north of Scotland to the main, you know, from the rural areas, the country areas, um, to the to the major towns, all these lodges were given a promise, we'll leave you very much alone um, as long as you agree to becoming a daughter lodge of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. So all these lodges are given that promise and the same promise is given to, sorry, going the wrong way, all these, all these lodges, all these um, lodges accept that promise and then the Grand Lodge extends the same promise to these lodges which were not interested in a Grand Lodge. And that's why, as I said, Freemasonry in Scotland is very different from Freemasonry anywhere else. So um, the consequences of making that kind of an appeal to the lodges in Scotland to join the Grand Lodge, um, this is the kind of thing that happened. Um, slowly but surely, some of these lodges did join the Grand Lodge of Scotland, but by no means all. Now the promises um, that they made means that to this day in Scotland, in Masonic lodges, there is no such, there is no such thing as a standard ritual, there is no thing as standard regalia, nor is there any kind of standard lodge layout. All these things are left in the hands of the lodge itself. So that means that the lodge can actually devise its own ritual. So when a lodge is founded here in Scotland, the brethren founding that lodge can sit down and decide what their ritual is going to be. Um, the other big thing that makes Scottish Freemasonry different is that they can choose their own regalia. So there is no standard colour of regalia. Uh, their colour can be a single colour, blue, red, green, um, a combination of blue and red, um, or it can even be, even be tartan. Because of the ritual that the lodge uses, um, the layout of the lodge can be different from lodge to lodge. So it means that in many ways, the Grand Lodge of Scotland can interfere um, in how lodges do things because every lodge does things differently. Um, and so to impose standardization across Scottish Freemasonry would not be acceptable um, to Scottish lodges, especially when they cherish the differences they have for every other lodge. Uh, and I'll give you a, a very quick example of how treasured um, this difference between lodges is. Um, there, was, uh, there were two lodges, one still exists, there were two lodges that met um, on either side of a mountain here in Scotland. Um, but there was no connecting road, so they didn't visit each other. It was a, uh, just a very long journey on foot, be, you know, having no way of getting by road. Um, anyway, um, oddly enough, that was the European um, Union um, that uh, funds came from the European Union, and a new road was built that eventually connected these two, two villages together. And... Uh, they visited each other and to their dismay they both discovered they were doing pretty much the same ritual as each other. Now <laughs> to them that was really that was not on that was not what Scottish Freemasonry was about so they both went away and they decided to change the ritual by buying the printed rituals from the Grand Lodge of Scotland but of course you're going to guess what happened aren't you? they both bought the same rituals. <laughs> so although they both changed the rituals, they both changed it to the same ritual. Um, uh, needless to say, there was another meeting at which they decided who was going to use which ritual as long as they were different from each other. So that kind of shows you um, how important the differences between lodges 
are here in Scotland. Um, just to give you a, an idea of what um, rituals are and there are more, but these are the printed rituals um, that we have. Um, and of course, for whatever reason, uh, one is called the standard ritual, even although there is no such thing in Scottish Freemasonry. But there is one called the standard ritual. But you will notice that standard um, has inverted commas around it. So I think someone was um, being a little bit tongue in cheek um, by saying this is the standard. Um, the standard ritual, just again, um, rabbiting on, I know, but the standard ritual is, is considered by many to be a very basic um, ritual um, uh, for use in Scotland. Um, it's, uh, it would be similar in status, I think, to the emulation ritual in England. Um, and then we have um, things like the modern ritual, the Gaudiolot ritual, uh, which is from Glasgow, the McBride ritual, which is used uh, on the West Coast, the McWhorter ritual, which is used in places like South Africa, and so on, so on, so on. So we have this situation of every lodge doing things differently, including the regalia. I thought you might like to have a look at um, a, a typical modern uh, Scottish apron. Um, and as you can see, uh, this is tartan, a uh, nice bright tartan. It's uh, the tartan, or uh, the Royal Stuart tartan. That is Bonnie Prince Charlie's uh, tartan, Royal Stuart. Of course, Stuart, uh, Charles Edward Stuart is the full uh, name of Bonnie Prince Charlie. So this lodge has adopted um, Royal Stuart tartan um, for its use. And so one visual difference from lodge to lodge is the regalia. And if you ever come to a Scottish lodge, especially a lodge that's got lots of visitors from other lodges, then you will see virtually every colour of the rainbow um, uh, at a Masonic lodge in Scotland. Uh, different lodges, different colours. Um, uh, does occasionally cause problems because of the different rituals. So they have uh, different timings for doing, shall we say, timings of signs, etc. Um, so that I've seen some Americans uh, come to a Scottish lodge and think think it's utter chaos uh, because <laughs> everybody's doing different things. But that's simply because we have a golden rule here in Scotland. Uh, you just do as you were taught to do in your mother lodge and you will never be wrong. And so if you keep that same kind of golden rule in mind, then that's the reason why there are lots and lots of differences as to what they're all doing um, at these uh, various lodges. So I hope that that's given you some kind of insight into the reasons why uh, uh, Scottish Freemasonry is different. It's different because the creation of the Grand Lodge of Scotland um, followed a different history. And the consequence of that different history meant that Scottish Freemasonry is essentially different from anywhere else. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. And uh, diversity makes it, makes it more interesting, I think. Uh, and not necessarily bad any, or wrong anything about it. Uh, so uh, everyone who wants to ask the question, you need to use but a raise hand on the right side of your uh, screen, Zoom screen. Please uh, get ready yourself and uh, I'll follow the order. I'll have just two quick questions before all the brothers will have, uh, will have their questions ready. First question is uh, regarding the uh, regarding the uh, um, uh, the lodges itself. Well, one of the regularity issues today is that the three consecrating lodges that they are, are creating grand lodge, for instance, on a, uh, on a, anywhere, uh, they should be regularly consecrated. So that is a kind of a direct implication. It should be, it is a must. So in case of Scotland, it was just uh, 
lodges existed and the Grand Lodge uh, was created by them. While in England, you just said the three, four lodges, which kind of created Grand Lodge, and then it created all the other lodges. Still here uh, in uh, Scotland, who kind of, who consecrated or who created the lodges? I understand the guild was uh, Freemasons plus uh, two other uh, kind of crafts that were part of the guilds. So that is why for Masons only, they created lodges where they had this knowledge transfer um, uh, hermetically kind of separately from the guilds. Well, that's at, at least one of the versions now uh, John Dickey has shared in his book. So anyway, uh, my question is where the lodges came from and what for them would mean regularly consecrated, if anything at all? Okay, I think, um, I think we must uh, clear up. And I know I, know I, I, I have uh, John Dickey's book. And I, I hate to um, have to contradict um, um, some people, but um, there is a, unfortunately, we, we in Scotland being a small country um, tend to uh, be perceived as being part of England. And that's very common, um, even, even today in the news, uh, they will say that England is doing this when they actually mean Britain which includes Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, um, as well as England. What they mean is the United Kingdom or Britain, um, and, and they get confused. So let me just clarify, because this is an extremely uh, important point, and it's a bit of a history lesson, so please bear with me. Guilds existed in Scotland and England, but what happened was that um, Henry VIII, because the Pope wouldn't give him as many divorces as he wanted, um, uh, decided that he was going to get rid of the Pope and he was going to become the head of the church in England, which he did. So he became the head of the church in England. The religious um, uh, um, uh, ceremonies and all the rest of it didn't change. Uh, they continued very much the same um, as uh, previously, um, but Henry VIII realized that now that he was the head of the church in England, um, all their property, all their money was his. And so he stole it. He stole it all. He stole their property, he stole their money, and he forbade them for doing anything that followed the original church, the church before he became the head of the church. And he abolished all the guilds. So the guilds were destroyed in England by Henry VIII. Um, and he also uh, did away with monasteries and those kind of organizations. So that was the, the Reformation in England. And the Reformation was dynastic and political, okay? In Scotland, the Reformation, which happened almost 20 years later than England, the, um, the Reformation in Scotland was completely different. It was religious in nature. Um, it imposed a Calvinistic um, view of Protestantism. It swept away the Roman Catholic Church, but it left everything else intact, okay? So it was a religious reformation that replaced the religious practices in Scotland but it did not get rid of anything else. And guilds continued to exist, okay? So guilds in Scotland, and some of them still exist, particularly in Glasgow, they have a continuous history. Um, they change from being a, a, a guild in the medieval sense into charities, um, supporting uh, local charities, but they, they have a continuous recorded existence. Now, this is where things are very different um, from England. Even before the guilds were destroyed by Henry VIII, there, there were major differences between guilds in England and in Scotland. In Scotland, they tend to be called incorporations because guilds were incorporated into the city political structure. And that meant that guilds were the uh, public face of specific trades. 
So you had Baxters, which are bakers in Scotland. Uh, um, uh, you have um, uh, all sorts of other things like uh, um, shoemakers, uh, uh, hammermen, um, uh, hat makers, all these, and typically non guilds were the most important ones or incorporations. The, the incorporation or guild of masons, which ceased to exist in England, when the Reformation came along, um, they were allowed to continue in existence, but they simply lost their religious aspect. So they carried on as before, they were the economic powerhouse behind the, behind the trade of stone masonry. The difference was in Scotland, the incorporation or guild of stone masons included rights, that is carpenters, um, coopers, um, which are barrel makers, and also other trades that are associated with the construction of buildings. So glaziers, tilers, etc., etc. That caused a big problem for the stonemasons because how do you transfer the secrets of stone masonry when you've got people who are not stonemasons present? So you've got um, particularly carpenters and coopers who work in wood who are present during the ceremonies of the guild. Well, you can't transmit stonemason secrets when carpenters can overhear them. They had their own secrets. So what the stonemasons of Scotland did was to transmit the secrets from one generation of stonemasons to the next, they created a different organization, an additional organization called the Lodge. So the guilds were public, everybody knew about them, but the lodges were secret and they were secret because that was what was necessary in order to transmit the secrets of the stonemasons from one generation to the next. Now, the incorporation of hammermen, that is people who worked in metal, blacksmiths and the like, there was only uh, metal workers in that guild. And so they transmitted their, their secrets within that guild. There was no need for any other organization because they're all just metal workers and nobody else was in that guild. And so that's where we end up with this secret organization of stonemasons that nobody but stonemasons could join, whereas the guild of stonemasons, carpenters and others could join. And that's a very, very important difference that applies uh, only in Scotland. It doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, the only trade that had this extra secret organization. And so this, this, your second point about the legitimacy, the need for legitimacy, um, this is something that was extremely important in the medieval period because um, uh, guilds were made up of just ordinary working people. They were um, fairly low on the social scale. Um, they were not aristocrats. They couldn't read and write. They were ordinary working men. And to set up an organization, just like, oh, well, we're going to, we're going to create a trade union or we're going to form whatever, would have been, uh, uh, it just would be unthinkable because of their position in society. So getting legitimacy from somewhere was, in, was very, very important. And that legitimacy came from, um, in a very unusual way, from the religious sphere, because the stonemasons were granted certain rights and privileges by the medieval church, and that legitimized the, the, them as stonemasons in the eyes of the church, that is the Roman Catholic Church, and when that church disappeared during the Reformation, they still had the legitimacy that had been granted to them beforehand, and they simply continued that. The need for a legitimacy uh, became even more important, though, as new lodges were founded, they had to try and get permission from somewhere else, because the church, this was secret, of course, they, to, they couldn't go to the church, 
and say, look, we're a secret organization. Will you give us permission um, to form a secret lodge? Um, they couldn't do that. So they went to other lodges to get permission. And the classic example of that is a lodge we've already mentioned, or both lodges we've mentioned, um, Canongate Cowinning number two in Edinburgh. They didn't go to the other lodge in the city, Mary's Chapel. They went to a, a, a lodge on the other side of the country, uh, Mother Cowinning, um, and got permission uh, for, uh, for, from them to form a lodge in Edinburgh in the Canongate, hence the name. Um, and that, that, that permission was given in 1677. So this need for legitimacy um, existed in Scotland from lodge to lodge, but when the Grand Lodge came along, they needed legitimacy as well, and they got it from the four lodges in Edinburgh that were erecting the Grand Lodge. Sorry, I know that's a very long explanation, but some of that's very important in understanding the Scottish uh, history. So my apologies for the history lesson. But no so apologies, that's, that's why we are here to learn <laughs> from the history. Thank you so much, um, understood. Let's give floor to Brother Francisco Roldan. Floor is yours, I'll meet yourself, please. Thanks, David. Uh, hi, Robert. I um, have uh, this, this uh, one question that is two. Why the color green of St. Clair's apron? And if that is what the official color of the Grand Lodge of Scotland today? And since the time of William Shaw, there was already the Scottish rule that each lodge could use its own Masonic dress and its own. That was my question. Thanks, Bob. Okay, the first one is, is fairly straightforward. Yes, the, the colours of Grand Lodge are green and gold. Um, and they're also the colour of the Grand Lodge Tartan, by the way, are the two principal colours of the Grand Lodge Tartan. Um, and there's a reason for that. Um, many of the uh, early aristocrats who formed the Grand Lodge of Scotland were also Knights of the Thistle, which is the, or the oldest cheval recorder in Scotland. And so they chose the colours of the Knights of the Thistle. So it's called Thistle Green and Gold. And that's the colour of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. Um, and I believe that the, the watered blue or the watered uh, blue silk used by the Grand Lodge of England is the colour of the Knights of the Garter, which is the oldest uh, cheval recorder in England. And equally, I'm not going to swear to this, but I think that the colour of the Grand Lodge of Ireland is the colour of the Grand Lodge of, uh, 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 Grand Lodge of Ireland's colours are based on the order of the uh, order of, oh gosh, that's shocking. Um, anyway, the oldest order in Ireland, the oldest chivalric order, that's terrible. It'll come to me, I forget, I forget the name. Um, at St. Patrick, the Order of St. Patrick, of course, being Ireland. Um, and so uh, I think that's where the colours come from. Uh, uh, and, and that's reflected in the painting of William St. Clair of Roslyn, which was green right from the very beginning of the Grand Lodge. Um, uh, your second point about whether they were using uh, colours um, uh, in the time of William Shaw. Well, unfortunately, the, answer, the simple answer is we do not know. Um, the, the even, I mean, the minutes tell us very little, very little indeed about the ceremony. Uh, they tell us that people were admitted um, as entered apprentices or actual admitted apprentices, as it was termed, um, and, and made fellows of craft. But it tells us nothing about the ceremonial. Um, I think they were more interested in recording the person's name and the fact that they paid to join the lodge. So there's a record of the money coming in um, for all these candidates. Um, so that, that, that answer is it's not very good, but I can't answer it. Even the rituals, uh, which were much later, the Scottish rituals tell us very little about the actual ceremony. They tell us a little bit, but not much. In terms of regalia, they tell us nothing at all. 
So all we can assume is that every lodge had made up its own way of doing things. And that's what continued after 1736. But there's no way of knowing for sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there is a question from uh, Brother Frank uh, Mickings from South Africa. Uh, Brother Bob, when did Scottish Freemasonry arrive to South Africa? <laughs> I thought you were going to ask me that. Um, <laughs> It was quite uh, quite late for, for, gosh, I think somebody's trying to get in touch. Um, we, Grand Lodge publishes a yearbook which tends to Can I come back to that question later? I'll give me a few minutes to a few sure. minutes to check on that. Meanwhile, we, we go Along with something, go on with something else. Sure. Uh, then, uh, then I'll uh, uh, invite to the floor, Brother David Barrett. Floor is yours, and then we have a few more questions on from the chat as well. Um, Brother Robert, thank you again for a very interesting lecture. I would like to know when did the Grand Lodge of Scotland start granting overseas warrants, and by any chance, are there any lodges anywhere? As we say, shall we say, over the border, they actually work under the aegis of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. Uh, the first overseas lodge, uh, very intriguingly, was founded in 1739, and it was in no less a place than Aleppo, Syria, what is now Syria. Um, so 1739, Aleppo. Um, I'll remember the name of it in a minute. Um, can't recall it now. But yes, so yeah, that was the first one, the first um, overseas lodge. It doesn't exist any longer, of course. The first overseas lodge, um, which still exists, um, is Lodge St. George. Um, <laughs> don't ask. Lodge St. George, the patron saint of England. Um, lodge St. George um, in... Uh, in the Bahamas uh, was the oldest lodge founded by the Grand Lodge of Scotland in, and uh, again, I'll tell you that in a minute. Uh, again, it's me having to look up some of the things I didn't, uh, uh, St. George in Bermuda. So I'll come back to you with an exact date on that. Uh, was that was that all? Was there anything else? No, I'm just wondering something? if there were any lodges over the border Ireland, oh. UK, which actually, actually work <laughs> under the aegis of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. Uh, yes, um, uh, there was at least one I can think of from the top of my, my head, um, and it's 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 a place that's actually been in the headlines quite recently, Barnard Castle, um, where one one of the members of the government decided to go during the lockdown and got into trouble for it. There was a Scottish lodge in Barnard in Barnard Castle in the, in the northeast of England. Uh, I think there was one in Carlisle, uh, typically just across the border. Equally there, oh, there was one in the Isle of Man as well. Um, but there were a couple of English lodges in Scotland just over the border, uh, more particularly the Royal Arch Chapters, maybe not lodges, but certainly Royal Arch Chapters. Um, but that was because the border, and, and certainly 300 years ago, the border was quite fluid um, until it became sort of somebody actually drew a line across a map and says, you can't have a lodge there. That's on my side of the line. Yeah. So. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brother Bob, you may want to take the call or something. I mean, we can interrupt. No, no, no. It's, it's messages saying no. It's, no, fine. it's just it's just a text message. Yeah. Um, uh, the, okay. The lodge um, um, Saint George in Bermuda. Um, Saint George, as I say, patron saint of uh, of oh, England, God. was founded in 1797, and it still meets in Bermuda today. Thank you. Uh, there is a question from uh, Joseph uh, Rodriguez. Uh, do each of the lodges have their printed ritual books? 
and uh, do some of the lodges follow the same ritual? Um, without, <laughs> here's the problem. I mean, there's over, there's about 660 lodges in Scotland, um, all the ability to do different things. So I haven't visited every single one, so I can't, I can't sort of answer that question positively. Um, what I can say is that the, the lodges I have visited, some of them are dramatically different one from another. What a lot of them will do just for ease is to buy a printed lodge um, from the Grand Lodge of Scotland, say uh, the McBride ritual. That's not a good example. There's only about 10 lodges use that. But um, say um, Harvey's ritual is a very popular ritual. They'll buy Harvey's printed ritual. And then I've been to a lodge where they'll have the ritual book but there's big red lines scoring out whole pages and they've glued in other pages that they want in place of the bit of the ritual that they don't like. So you can get a Harvey's ritual from the lodge, but it's not the Harvey's ritual that you buy from Grand Lodge. And that's because they can change it and they can change bits mm -hmm. of it to suit the way they do things. So, um, and that, one of the benefits of that, I probably shouldn't be telling you these things, but one of the benefits of that is that nobody, nobody um, in authority in Scotland can say, you're doing that wrong because you'd have to know what every single lodge in Scotland does before you could tell them it's wrong. And of course, try to remember 660 rituals is impossible. So, <laughs> so... So, grant, you know, so Scottish lodges can pretty much do what they like, and certainly in terms of ritual, because it's not possible to know what every lodge is actually doing. Some Joseph? of them write the ritual from scratch, I should say. Some of them have got rituals that are, um, you can't buy. The only way to learn the ritual is to go to the lodge. And there are a handful of lodges still in Scotland that have no written ritual at all. The only way you can learn the ritual is go to the home of a past master and be taught it for the particular office that you are in in that lodge. Okay, Brother Bill, now you said you have the Harvey's ritual book. Does the Grand Lodge of Scotland have other uh, ritual books too of, other than yeah. Harvey's? Yeah, that, that list that I showed you in, in the PowerPoint I think there was eight, nine. Uh, there are printed rituals that you can get from the Grand Lodge of Scotland. Yeah, but okay. as I say, what, although although that's what they produce, uh, a lot of Scottish lodges will take that ritual and change it. Um, okay. So you'll get a Scottish lodge that says we use the Harvey's ritual. The, diff the the question you've got to ask is, is it the Grand Lodge Harvey's ritual or is it your own Harvey's ritual? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Okay, thank you very much. Very flexible. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, the, that's the privilege they have got uh, from the very beginning, so they can do whatever they want. Yeah. So, uh, Brother Dimitrios, floor is yours. Thank you, Brother David. Thank you, Brother Bob. Nice meeting you again. Um, yeah. I have... I have seen this uh, very, very nice document you presented in the first uh, slide. And I mentioned two points. Uh, first of all, it says that uh, uh, the next installation will be in St. John's uh, Day. So could you please comment if this happened ever in Scotland? And secondly, I've seen that uh, this invitation uh, is uh, uh, for the um, worshipful master and the wardens or the proxy master mason or fellow craft of the lodges. This means that some lodges at that time in 1736 didn't have the third degree in their own ritual. Thank you. Okay. Um, let me think. Um, 
your sorry, your first question was about the letter. Sorry, Dimitri, I'm thinking about your uh, second. Uh, the, the first one was about St. John's Day. Oh, yes, okay. So here we come to a very important point. Um, and this is not terribly well understood. Um, the people who were uh, intent on creating the Grand Lodge of Scotland, um, as well as realizing they needed legitimacy from somewhere, and they got it from these four lodges, they also realized that it would increase their legitimacy if they followed the exact procedure followed by the Grand Lodge of England. And that's exactly what they did. They um, found out exactly how the Grand Lodge of England had been founded by four lodges, hence four lodges here in Scotland, and they followed the same template, if you like, the same pattern for the Grand Lodge um, of England. Now, that meant um, that only four lodges could be involved in that that gave them the excuse to exclude other lodges who might want, have wanted um, to have been involved. But the Grand Lodge of England, and you can understand this in a minute, the Grand Lodge of England, um, they founded their Grand Lodge on the 24th of June, um, which was the, was the St. John the Baptist Day. So that letter, again reflects the English way or for, of forming the Grand Lodge of England. Now this tells us something very important. It tells us that the Grand Lodge of Scotland, or those organizing the Grand Lodge of Scotland, didn't know about um, the operative lodges practices. Because St. John the Baptist did not and does not feature within Scottish Freemasonry. Now let's think about this. Um, and I, I mean, we're, we're getting, a, it gets a little bit long-winded, but I'll do it as quickly as I can. When the, uh, the stonemasons um, were granted um, incorporation status, that is, they became a recognized guild, um, the charter they got, which was called a seal of cause, the charter that they got um, named, uh, and this was in 1475, named St. John the Eva Evangelist and St. John the Baptist, okay? St. John the Baptist is mentioned first and St. John the Baptist is mentioned second. The Baptist is very much secondary, and this is in the hierarchy of the medieval church, of course. So the Evangelist is by far and away the most important uh, saint St. John the Baptist is secondary. And proof of that is that um, the church um, in the cathedral here in Scotland, uh, St. Giles Cathedral, the church granted the stonemasons of Scotland the Isle of St. John the Evangelist to look after. Um, and that is why St. John the Evangelist became the patron saint of Scottish stonemasons, not the Baptist although the Baptist is mentioned, who could have two patron saints? Well, no, nobody really. I mean, that'd be like saying you've got two patron saints of Scotland or whatever. So you only have one patron saint, and they chose the first named in the charter, St. John the Evangelist. Now, because England had chosen um, St. John the Baptist, the new Grand Lodge have got a problem. And I suspect they're already understanding the problems because they've sent out these letters saying we're going to hold our regular meetings on St. John the Baptist Day only to find out that these 79 operative lodges that said, no, we don't want anything to do with you, part of it was because they were going to hold their, uh, their meetings on a day that was not the patron saint of Scottish Freemasons. They were going to hold it on something called St. John the Baptist Day. That's another reason why the operative masons didn't want anything to do with the Grand Lodge of Scotland. They already understood that and you can see that from the letter because they are actually inviting people to the inaugural meeting 
on the 30th of November, St Andrew's Day. And that's why the Grand Lodge of Scotland to this day meets, has its main meeting on St Andrew's Day, the 30th of November. And as far as I know, it's the only Grand Lodge in the world that has um, neither St John in its calendar. They don't meet on the 27th of December, St John the Evangelist Day, and they don't meet on the 24th of June, St John the Baptist Day. They meet on the 30th of November, St Andrew's Day. But you've just got to bear in mind that the whole world is out of step with Scotland when it comes to matters such as this. There were, uh, there were other questions as well. Yeah, it was uh, the other question was that uh, in the invitation it's mentioned about the proxy uh, who Fellowship. will be a master mason or a fellow craft. And yeah. if this means that some lodges don't have the third degree ritual at that time. We, we know that many of them did not, and there's a very good reason for that. Um, one of them is that um, from the rituals that exist, there were, it seems that there were only two degrees, but we've talked about this before, that's now in grave doubt here in Scotland. But let's, let's assume that there was only two degrees, just for, the, for, for this question. So there's only two degrees, okay, and we know um, that this was the case for many of the operative lodges, and we know this because when some of them actually eventually joined the Grand Lodge of Scotland, and we're talking about as late as 1810, coming up for a hundred years later, some of these lodges didn't work the third degree. And the Grand Lodge of Scotland actually had to send teams of people to these lodges to show them how the third degree worked. Now, without going into specifics, let's think about this. The operative lodges only had two degrees, entered apprentice and fellow of craft. If these lodges joined the Grand Lodge of Scotland, a speculative body working a third degree, think about the content of the third degree. Who are the bad people in the third degree? More specifically, who are the bad brethren in the third degree? Well, the bad people are fellows of craft. So what you're saying to operative lodges in Scotland is, come and join the Grand Lodge of Scotland, where in the third degree, you are bad, bad people. You are murderers. And the operative masons are going to say, wait a minute, you're telling us to join an organization that tells everyone that we are bad people, that we are murderers, simply because we're only fellows of craft. And you've got to realize that the third degree is an invention on part of the speculative masons. And that speculative third degree is being imposed on the operative masons who only have the fellow of craft as their highest degree. There's no way they're joining under those circumstances. They're not going to become the villains of Freemasonry because they're only fellows of craft. Now that situation existed in Scotland for a long time uh, until around about the 1780s, maybe a bit later, when the Mark degree appeared. Now those of you who know the Mark degree, um, in the Mark degree, the fellows of craft become the heroes. They become Masonic heroes. So fellows of craft um, in that ritual um, are, achieve redemption after the third degree. And that's when uh, these operative lodges in Scotland thought, ah, that's different now. We are no longer being accused of being murderers and, and, and bad people. We are now heroes. And so these operative lodges felt they could now join speculative Freemasonry. Although not all of them did. And in fact, the very last 
independent lodge um, was Lodge St John uh, in Melrose, which didn't join the Grand Lodge of Scotland until 1891, like 160 years after the Grand Lodge of Scotland was founded. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is a question from YouTube um, from uh, Graham, Graham uh, Sardan. Uh, was there any connections with the guilds in Scotland and in any in Ireland pre-masonry? And were there corresponding connections between any lodges? Um, no, because um, in, in Ireland and England, they didn't have any lodges. Certainly not lodges of the type that existed in Scotland. Um, there may have been um, what they call occasional lodges in England. And so we have people like Elias Ashmole joining a lodge in 1646. But nothing is known about that lodge. It was certainly not a lodge that we would recognise as a lodge in Scotland, it was held in a in a country mansion in Warrington in Cheshire. It was not uh, comparable to a Scottish lodge, and we only have Ashmole's uh, diary entry um, as a reference to that event. Uh, whereas in Scotland, the minutes are continuous, as I say, from 1599 to the present. Uh, Ireland and England have no lodge minutes until. Um, the early part of the 18th century. And so there's no way of comparing. Uh, as far as the guilds were concerned, guilds were very local. They were uh, very much focused on, and, and certainly guilds were uh, only in population centres. They didn't exist in the countryside. They only existed in towns. So um, they were focused on what was going on in the town, like Edinburgh, uh, Dundee, Aberdeen, whatever, um, and they weren't really interested in what was going on in another town. So there was no need to communicate between the two. What we do know, um, and we can glean this um, from the information that we do have, is that lodges in Scotland, um, not elsewhere, not outside Scotland, but what we know in Scotland was that they were aware of each other's existence. So in 1654, for example, um, a, a member of the lodge in Linlithgow visited the Lodge of Edinburgh and the Lodge of Edinburgh recorded the fact that they had a visitor from that lodge and having tested him, admitted him to the lodge. Um, equally, the, we've already mentioned the charter that was granted to uh, Canongate Cowinning by Lodge Mother Cowinning in 1677. So they must have known of each other's existence for these things to take place. Um, and equally, the fact that um, all, the old, all the earliest rituals, uh, of which there's about six, all from different parts of Scotland, um, are virtually identical. So we know that the lodges in Scotland, the network of lodges in Scotland, were pretty much um, doing the same basic things, although there was no doubt concern, concern considerable differences from, from area to area, but the basics were the same. So we do know that they talked to each other, but outside Scotland, there was no network of lodges to communicate with. Okay, thank you, answers taken. Uh, before giving floor to Brother John, there is a question in chat room uh, from uh, Ethan, um, Singapore. I would like to ask, did the formation of the Grand Lodge of Scotland somehow impacted the Mason's word, which is unique to Scottish Freemasonry? As right now, it seems to be a forgotten thing or seldom talked about in the lodges. Um, the Mason's word, to have the Mason's word was to be a Freemason. And that's what it refers to. So to have the Mason word uh, means that you had been initiated into a, into a lodge. And we know this um, uh, for two reasons uh, or two sources. The first one uh, was in the late 1650s when a man um, by the name of Kirk, I can't remember his first name, 
a man by the name of Kirk um, applied to become the minister of the Church of Scotland uh, for the parish of Minto in Roxburghshire, in the Scottish borders, basically. And the, the people, what they call the, um, the presbytery of the church, um, uh, were not sure whether he was a suitable candidate. Um, and they wrote to the, the neighboring church saying, um, this man who's applied for this job as minister um, has the Mason's word. We don't know if that makes him eligible to become a minister of the Church of Scotland. So in other words, what they're saying is, this guy's a Freemason, um, does that disqualify him from becoming a minister of the church? And the reply was, um, somebody having the Mason's word uh, is no bar to becoming a Church of Scotland minister. So that's, that's one reference to the Mason's word, meaning he is a Freemason. The other one um, comes from an English dictionary of slang, uh, which contains a reference to the Mason's word. And the, this uh, book of English slang is in the 1690s. And it's, it's mentioned that a Scottish slang word of having the Mason's word means someone who's joined a lodge. So it's a kind of, a, 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 it's a quick way of, a, a Scottish way of explaining that someone is a member of a lodge. And uh, you're right, we don't use that. But a lot of the Scottish, a lot of the Scottish ways of saying things have been, uh, have become anglified. That is, they have become, uh, in, they've become English. An English uh, way of saying things has been applied and the Scottish way of saying things has been forgotten and is no longer used. And that's not just within Freemasonry. That applies to a lot of the Scottish language, uh, a lot of the Scottish culture. There we are. Thank you. Uh, my question, quick question. Is word who's uh, who, uh, the Scottish in the ancient and it's accepted it's for the shrine? Who's a, who's a, is this word Scottish uh, by origin? Do you, do you use it? Did you use it? The word huzza? In, is that like hurrah? Yes. Is, is it a toast or is it in the it ritual? Is, it, is, yeah. uh, no. it is in the ancient and Scottish and, and accept, accepted, ancient and accepted Scottish rite. That's part of the uh, kind of wording which is used there in explanation right. that that is for yeah. Europe, but Scottish way. Yeah. And so just simple question, is it is it true? Is it not? No, no, no. The ancient and accepted Scottish right didn't arrive here in Scotland until um, 1856, I think it was. So it's a very new organization in terms of our history. No, um, no, but so, the word itself, um, the word Husa or Husa or Hooray, is that Scottish word? No, no. It's not used at all no, in Scotland. Nothing. No, nothing not as far it. as I know. No, <laughs> I, I think in fact it's a, I think it's probably an English word, but I would need to check my Scottish dictionary to be honest, but I don't <laughs> think so. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brother John, floor is yours. Brother David, thank you for entertaining my question and, and thank you for all of this work you have been doing for these past months, bringing us these, uh, these very interesting and informative discussions. Brother Cooper, um, as usual, uh, you have presented us with a lot of uh, intriguing information, but I have a question. Uh, you, you talked about the legitimacy of lodges and the Grand Lodge seeking legitimacy. Now, in a previous presentation to us, you, you talked about the Official Secrets Act and how the Scottish, the Grand Lodge of Scotland intervened uh, with the parliamentarians and said, if we can vote for the, the lodges, uh, then they will not be deemed illegal. And that, that happened and hence the, the Grand Lodge of Scotland has legitimacy. So now my question, uh, and, and no insult to you because you work with the Grand Lodge of Scotland, but what is the function of the Grand Lodge of Scotland now? Uh, you know, they, the lodges are fairly independent in terms of, of the adoption of ritual layout of lodges and regalia. 
So what does the Grand Lodge of Scotland do for the lodges to justify their, their per capita payments to the Grand Lodge? Thank you, David. Um, yeah, well, the Grand Lodge of Scotland um, is, uh, unlike the Grand Lodge of England, is mainly uh, an advisor or facilitator. And I can, uh, I can sum it up no better than having been in an English lodge, when a letter um, arrives from the Grand Lodge of England, it says to the lodge that uh, from Monday the 16th, you will do this, you will do that, you will increase your fees, um, you will donate X amount of money to this cause or that cause. A similar letter sent to a Scottish lodge would be along the lines of, we think that it might be a good idea if the brethren of the lodge would like to think about um, increasing the amount of money they pay for um, this uh, cause or that cause. But of course, remember that this is really only a recommendation or a suggestion. Um, and we do hope that you will agree with us and implement uh, the request. So that's the difference, um, I think, uh, summed up between the style of addressing the lodges. Um, what they do do um, very much is they, uh, they uh, grant charter, um, they give advice, and they will also make representations at a national level on things that are out with normal lodge control. So they will engage, if necessary, with government and other external organizations on behalf of the whole of the Scottish craft. And that's the kind of national um, uh, dimension. Then the international dimension, of course, is very important to, to us in Scotland. We see Scottish Freemasonry uh, as very much a, a very large family spread across the world um, with lodges in 42 other countries. So we're very much part of an international family. And so keeping that family, um, <laughs> that Scottish family um, together, despite all the usual family disagreements, all the family squabbles. Um, so Grand Lodge in many ways acts as a referee or as a father um, or a mother um, in dispute. But essentially, it is, a, a, it is a, an overall umbrella to try and keep Scottish Freemasonry in the main uh, going in the same direction instead of spinning off and doing all sorts of different things. Because I know there's a great deal of appeal by some lodges to get involved in things that, frankly, they shouldn't get involved in. But that's because of their independence. They think that they can get involved in. If I, may be, things that they should. if I may be allowed then to sure. ask a follow-up question, David, uh, and that is, um, how does the Grand Lodge of Scotland go about presenting a unified voice uh, on things, say, anti-Masonic anti things? And you've mentioned in the past uh, a number of, uh, of, of uh, journalists present these, these, uh, these issues. You could have, you have 600 and some odd lodges in the Grand Lodge of Scotland's jurisdiction. You could possibly have 660 different flavors of a response to, to an issue. Is that, is that problematic or does the Grand Lodge of Scotland have some operative process whereby the, the public messaging uh, and, and the brand of the, of the Freemasonry can continue uh, intact? And that would be my last question. Yeah. Um like any any Grand Lodge, there are individuals who are members of Grand Lodge who will speak to the media um, without thinking. Um, or um, there are quite often, unfortunately, disaffected Freemasons who are happy to give the media a critical quote. Um, the answer is always uh, from the Grand Lodge of Scotland and indeed other Grand Lodges like the Grand Lodge of England. The answer is, we are the legitimate voice of Scottish Freemasonry, not an individual. And so that's the answer that we typically give. Um, so if, uh, and, and, and typically you can say, well, would you accept um, 
um, somebody speaking uh, on behalf of the royal family who are not members of the royal family. It's not a legitimate um, a source of information. And that's all we can do. If the media want to make something out of what one individual says, then there's not a lot we can say other than, well, that's one person's opinion. It's not legitimate. Okay, thank you for the answer. There was a question from Brother Hasso. Uh, do the lodges and the district Grand Lodges and the Grand Lodge of Scotland also have their own rituals or have they adopted the various existing rituals already practiced in Scotland? Uh, provincial and district Grand Lodges are not, um, are not ritual performing bodies. They are supervisory bodies. No, no, the lodges the, under the district. So just to make it. Oh sure. yes. Oh, sorry. The lodges so, under. Yes. Lodges under. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was in South Africa last year. Um, very interesting to see um, lots of differences there. Scottish lodges all doing their own thing, um, within reason, of course. I mean, you can't you can't have day glow pink regalia, for example, and that's not a criticism of the colour, it's just a, a matter of Masonic decorum. Um, and so, you know, but there are lots of differences, lots of different colours and lots of different um, uh, rituals. In fact, one of them is where uh, the McWhorter ritual comes from. Um, so, yeah, lots of differences under different parts of the world. Thank you. Uh, Brother Neil, floor is yours. not doing anything crazy. <laughs> Brother Cooper, thank you for uh, such an interesting um, discussion. I'm interested specifically in the differences between the lodges and because of ritual. And does it ever cause a problem with visitation or as long as the different lodges are properly warranted by the Grand Lodge of Scotland, people go and, and are welcome? Yeah. Um, visitors in Scotland are usually, I mean, in, in, I have to say, Visiting is a very big thing here. So visiting lodges um, is very common. It happens in uh, quite significant numbers. And because of the number of lodges, um, it's possible. See, it's, uh, say here in Edinburgh itself, with over 30 lodges, um, it's possible to attend seven lodge meetings uh, a week here. Um, not on a Sunday and how seven goes into six is like this. You can have um, a meeting every weekday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and two on Saturday. In fact, you could even have three. You could have eight meetings. There's a lodge that meets on Saturday morning, a lodge that meets on a Saturday afternoon, and one that meets on Saturday evening. So, and that can happen every single week. And that's before you go into all the other orders. That's just craft lodges. So it is possible to be out every single night of the week, except a Sunday, um, here in Scotland. Um, so visiting is a huge part of that. So it's an extremely busy Masonic scene, people going all over um, visiting different lodges. That means inevitably that, uh, certainly for people who are regular visitors, you become known. And so there's no need to, to establish who you are. And of course, uh, the, the mere fact that you're wearing different regalia immediately points out that you're not from that lodge. So if there's any doubt, look at the regalia. Okay, you're a visitor. Where are you from if we don't know you? Right, so that marks you out in, in the first place. And then there are obviously some very basic questions that are common to Freemasonry across the world. And it's those questions that are asked of visitors. If there is any doubt at all, then the, the, the question can become more intense. And if there's any doubt, and I have seen it happen, where, and I, I'll tell you a bit of a story, I have seen occasions when people are not admitted to the lodge because the, uh, the lodge isn't happy, They're simply not satisfied that that person's a Freemason. And one example, and I'm going to, I'm not giving you any names in order to protect the guilty, but I, one occasion a few years ago, um, I had a, 
an American, a, a United States Mason, uh, come into Grand Lodge and complain. Um, and uh, he was a 33rd degree Mason. He had one of these kind of wallets that held all the credit cards, which was his membership of every single branch of Freemasonry that he was a member of. Some things I'd never even heard of. Oh, look, you know, I'm a member of all these things and the lodge wouldn't allow me in. You know, he'd been playing golf somewhere and he heard there was a meeting and he went along and they wouldn't let him in. And he was black affronted that because he was such a, an important Freemason that this little Scottish lodge had turned him away. And I simply had to say to him, well, that's their right and privilege. And if you couldn't answer their questions, then they were right to turn you away. So he wasn't very happy, but that's the way things happen here. Good, thank you. Uh, regarding the visit, uh, visitation, um, that might uh, complement the uh, the question Brother John had earlier. Uh, if uh, the visitation comes from another uh, jurisdiction, then the clearance happens on the Grand Secretary's level, right? <laughs> It or uh, can, can, um, can Lodge admit the brother without even informing the Grand Secretary? Yes, it does happen. Um, normally, if somebody um, gets in touch saying, I'm going to be coming to Scotland next July, um, then the simple answer is, go and uh, contact your Grand Secretary. He'll contact our Grand Secretary and they'll make arrangements. Um, if there's not a lot of time, before someone coming on vacation or holiday, um, they should get a letter from their Grand Lodge, their Grand Secretary saying, uh, we vouch for this brother, he's coming from uh, Utah um, and he is a paid up member of our Grand Lodge. That would be accepted by the Lodge and that would avoid all the questioning. But it does happen that somebody that's going on holiday um, decides to go on holiday uh, quickly, that's the modern world, they, they find a, a cheap holiday in Scotland um, next week, and then they appear on the lodge doorstep, and that's when the questioning kicks in because there's been no time to make arrangements. Oh, okay. Uh, there is a question from Brother Javad. Uh, what was the name of Grand Lodge in 1736? Grand Lodge of Scotland? Sorry, say that again. I was reading the chat yeah. room. The, well, the, the question was, what was the name of the Grand Lodge in 1736? Grand Lodge of Scotland? Um, you know, I would have no, I think it's the Grand Lodge of Ancient Free and Accepted Masons. Um, and that was um, to make it very clear that it was, because they copied the name from England. So it would be the Grand Lodge of Scotland, just like the Grand Lodge of England. I've never, I've never checked to find out when the full grandiose title was given. Um, I'd have to find out. So the answer is I don't know. So I'm not going to give you any BS about that. Sorry. It seems so simple right in the beginning. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, Brother Gerard. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's like someone in the chat room has said. You know that a lot of it's noticeable that a lot of lodges were named after their place of origin, so the Lodge of Edinburgh. Um, and that's very true. I mean, most lodges, most of these early lodges, are simply named after where they were. But of course, in, in the cities, as more and more lodges um, came into existence, the need to differentiate them, they couldn't all be called the Lodge of Edinburgh. So they end up with the name becoming longer and longer. Thank you. Uh, Brother Salvino, floor is yours. Thank you, Brother David. Uh, Brother Robert, thank you again for your wonderful, very informative lecture. I have two questions. Uh, first question is having in mind this unique and beautiful independence of the Scottish lodges to have their own rituals. Um, are there any parts in the ritual that cannot be excluded, like, for example, the oath. Yes, there's some very basic, um, some very basic parts. I mean, you couldn't have 
you couldn't have the third degree without reference to HA, for example. Mm -hmm. So there's a got, I mean, there's, there's a fundamental underpinning to all the rituals that is, uh, has got to be uh, um, adhered to by all Scottish lodges. Uh, provided they do that, then they, they can add all sorts of additional um, things. The problem with doing that is, I mean, you, you could end up with, with degrees that take three hours to perform. And there are some lodges where I, I mean, I've been to some lodges where the, where the third degree takes three hours, at least three hours to, to, to perform. And that's because they do it in full. Um, and by that, I mean um, a lot of modern ritual. And uh, I mean, for example, um, the tracing board, um, there are, certainly in Scotland, there are usually three lectures for every tracing board, um, a short version, a medium-sized version, and a long version. Um, but some lodges have dropped that completely for the first and third degrees, and some have never, ever done the tracing board for the mark degree. Um, and that's simply a, a matter of trying to save time. Um, but some lodges say, no, no, the, the full ritual is the full ritual, and we've got to do that. Um, the problem with that, of course, is that a lot of visitors don't necessarily want to hang around for three hours while that's done. Um, so some lodges have a very long ritual, some have it shorter, um, but all of them must have all these basic elements to make it recognizably Masonic. <clears throat> And the second, thank you very much. And the second question is, um, it is known that the three sister um, Grand Lodges, the United Grand Lodge of England, Ireland and Scotland are not so much in willing to, to charter another jurisdictions um, or to create another Grand Lodges. Uh, for example, in Europe, we know that uh, United Grand Lodge of England chartered uh, France, Macedonia, Malta, as far as I know. Uh, and um, I mean, they are avoiding to do that. Um, and uh, the same thing is probably with Scotland, except that Scotland has, the Grand Lodge of Scotland has its own private lodges in districts abroad. But uh, as far as, uh, as I know, Scotland was involved also with England in. Um, uh, in Malta and in um, in Africa, in one Grand Lodge, and um, and Israel. And what is very interesting about Israel is that the consecration took place in Scotland and not in in Israel. Why that? Yeah, the, the Grand Lodge of Scotland doesn't consecrate many Grand Lodges. Um, I don't know why. I suspect. It's all to do with the, the desire to have the oldest Grand Lodge um, found the newest Grand Lodge. Um, but the founding of the Grand Lodge of Israel and the Grand Lodge of Turkey, oddly enough, um, was performed by the Grand Lodge of Scotland because I, do, I think Grand Lodge of Scotland is seen as being um, neutral. It doesn't have a lot of the political baggage that some other Grand Lodges might have. Um, so the Grand Lodge of Israel um, was founded by the Grand Lodge or consecrated by the Grand Lodge of Scotland, primarily because there was a lot of Scottish lodges in that part of the world, uh, including uh, Lebanon, Syria, uh, Jordan, uh, Israel, and Egypt. So there was lots of Scottish lodges in that region. So um, perhaps uh, it, it was seen as the natural uh, lodge, and I think equally uh, uh, for the same reason, Turkey um, uh, was founded by the Grand or consecrated by the Grand Lodge of Scotland. Um, the reason why, I mean, when the Grand Lodge of Israel was founded, it was a bit of a um, uh, the country was in a bit of a turmoil at the time, um, uh, which is just an unfortunate fact of history, and so uh, it was easier. Um, to do that in Scotland, we have we have at least three lodges. I, I'm, I'm reluctant to call them Jewish lodges, 
here in Scotland, but we have three lodges in Scotland which are uh, predominantly Jewish in membership. Um, uh, oddly enough, the one here in Edinburgh is nearly all, all made up of Jews and Roman Catholics. Um, and I, I know that not because they have to tell us, it's just I know that personally because I know a lot of the guys. Um, so I think it's down to the fact that Scotland is seen as uh, not only one of the oldest lodges, but it's seen as being quite neutral in terms of um, Freemasonry. Thank you. Brother Robert, uh, just for clarification, Grand Lodge of Turkey is not founded by Grand Lodge of Scotland, but reconsecrated. The term yes. is given by the Scottish Grand Lodge, reconsecrated. Yes, yes. I didn't just say for founded. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't say founded, I said consecrated. Yeah. Um, and that's that's important because there was a there was a gap. Um, but unfortunately, unlike Israel, they didn't use Grand Lodge of Scotland regalia, but yeah. Anyway, that's another story. Yes, that's another story, and it's a long story. So we use the term reconsecration, reconse not consecration oh, yeah. only. Yeah. And you don't tell it, but I tell it. Our regalia is this with the same color as the Grand Lodge of Scotland. I usually right. thought that I was Scottish Freemason when I met the International Grand Lodges meetings. No, I'm Turkish, but they, you know, think that I was Scottish Grand uh, Officer. Yeah. Yeah, what we tend to do, I think, is uh, we tend to focus on uh, district Grand Lodges overseas. And as the country matures um, and gets sufficient lodges, then um, we'll encourage the creation of a, a Grand Lodge in that country. There's no... There's no, there's no desire that you must remain Scottish. That's up to the lodges in these countries. Thank you. Uh, if I may, yes. Bob, if I may, um, you referred a few moments ago to the tracing board for the Mark degree. Does such a thing exist? I I can't find it. Yeah, I've got one in my garage. Oddly enough, um, it's very similar. Well. It contains a lot of elements of the second degree, um, so it's a it's an amalgamation. I mean, we've got to remember in Scotland, this is where it gets complicated because we're talking about Scotland again. What very yeah. quickly? What what happened so, so that you understand why we've got a tracing board at all? Um, in Scotland, um, as a in eighteen hundred, and this is on the back of the Secret Societies Act and or the Unlawful Societies Act, or whatever it was called, um, the Grand Lodge of Scotland, in its wisdom, made a public announcement, by public, I mean, it, it told all the lodges in the Masonic world, that as far as it was concerned, there was only three degrees in Freemasonry, Enter Apprentice, yeah. Fellow of Craft, and, and, and Master Mason, until mm. a lodge, um, a Scottish lodge, came along uh, to Grand Lodge, on the floor of Grand Lodge of Scotland and said, excuse me, you're wrong. And, <laughs> um, and <laughs> you can do that in Scotland. You can come along to Grand Lodge and tell them they're wrong, which may be a little bit different from other Grand Lodges. And the, the reason was you're wrong because Scottish Lodges are working something called the Mark Degree. Mm. But you've said there's only three, but my Lodge works four degrees. And, first, second, third, and the mark. So you're definitely wrong. And so <laughs> the Grand Lodge of Scotland had a little bit of an embarrassing time and they came up with a, a, a form of words to avoid that problem. And they said, and this is in the Constitution and Laws, Scottish Freemasonry consists of three degrees, three degrees only, which are the Entered Apprentice degree, the Fellow of Craft degree, including the mark, and the Master Mason's degree. So the Mark degree officially is part of the second degree, but it never takes place in the second degree. It's always quite separate. And that's why we have a tracing board that uses the second degree with Mark elements in it. 
but there is a tracing board, uh, yeah, very, very much so, and a couple of lectures to accompany it. Uh, where, where do I find this, Bob? Where do I find this? Because I, we, we, we use here the, the standard Scottish ritual, the, the famous red book, which, as you say, is pretty basic. But where do I find that, um, that, that information? Um, How can I um, get hold of the Mark tracing board <laughs> and inflict um, it upon sure. my blood <laughs> the I'm next sure. month? Okay. I'm sure Instead. I've got a photograph of it somewhere. Uh, I'm sure and, we've got photographs of it. And, and also the lectures. Yeah, I'll see what I can find out. Um, uh, yeah, of course, as you know, I'm, although I'm back um, at Grand Lodge part-time, yes. um, yeah. there's all sorts of parts of the building that I can't access, including the archives. But uh, I'll see what I can find when I, when I, when I go back. So, okay, thanks yeah. a lot, Bob. You, you know my uh, WhatsApp email. Thanks yeah. a lot for the information. Got you. Excellent All lecture, right. as excellent lecturer as always. By the way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, South there African, is a... South Africa, South Africa. Sorry, David. Just before yeah. I forget. Sure, um, sure. Go ahead. The earliest, the earliest date I've got for a Scottish lodge in South Africa is 1860. Well, I think there was one or two a bit earlier than that, um, but it's 1868 at the moment. Okay, that was exactly the comment we got uh, on YouTube uh, from Enterprise 1954. That's the nickname of the user. Uh, there was a question about Scottish Freemasonry in South Africa. The oldest Scottish lodge still working in South Africa is number 398 Southern Cross in Cape Town, chartered in 1860. So yeah. I, was, I was there last year, so yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, so that's, there you go. Uh, and he also says, uh, one lodge in Edinburgh uh, occasionally does the mark tracing board. I know because I've seen it done. That's, I guess, uh, for the Obridge uh, request. All right. So there you go. There you have the hint where to find the, the tracing board. <laughs> All right. Uh, there is a question uh, from Ryan. Uh, I'll read it. It, um, I, I, it may have nuances which I don't know, so I'll read it. Um, Brother David, this is Ryan um, Lel Sign, uh, uh, Master Lodge uh, Facility in Trinidad. What has uh, become of the other Scottish guilds which existed at the time of formation of Grand Lodge of Scotland? Are we in amity with any of them if they still exist? Yeah, well, what happened was um, guilds, guilds ceased to exist in England in the um, 1530s, 1540s. So what I'm saying is that uh, English guilds only existed 500 years ago, and they haven't existed since. So no guilds um, for 500 years. In Scotland, they continued after the Reformation. Um, and the reason, part of the reason why they continue to exist is that as well as um, having responsibility for a specific trade, like bakers or, or uh, shoemakers or whatever, um, part of the political system was that they had representatives on the town council. So these were, I suppose, like uh, they would probably call them councillors. Um, so they had a political voice in the running of the city. Um, uh, and that was, that was important, I suppose, when they were uh, important economic um, uh, bodies. Um, these trades were very important. They brought a lot of money into the, into the city. They also paid a lot of tax. Um, and so the local government um, loved them for that reason. But these, the, these were, this is, was not a democratic process. You were on the city council simply because you were a member of the guild. Um, the Reform Acts, um, the British Reform Acts of, um, from memory 1834, started to increase the franchise 
um, to people who um, were just ordinary people. And um, the guilds lost their political voice. So um, the guilds no longer had a, a religious purpose and they no longer had a political purpose. And that's why the guilds um, uh, slowly disappeared in many parts of Scotland. They still exist, particularly in Glasgow, where they are uh, local charitable organisations now. So a lot of them, like the, the Guild of Masons, still exists in Glasgow, but they, they perform only ceremonial functions and charitable fundraising um, uh, functions. Um, so in that sense, they became quite separated from Masonic lodges, and there is no real communication between the two anymore. Okay. Thank you for the answer. I'll just read up uh, the comment from Brother Hasso. Uh, I guess it's regarding the master's word. It is used uh, at the festive boards on continent. The word was used uh, at a festive board at a meeting I attended in Netherlands. Or could be for uh, Husa. He just didn't uh, say that. The, he's, he's not here. And No, he's here. Brother Hasso, is that uh, regarding the master's word or is it regarding uh, Hazu? Could you clarify just for recording purposes and for <laughs> curiosity as well? If you can speak up into the microphone. Sorry, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Quite, quite bad. Uh, unfortunately, your connection with us is very bad. I don't hear anything, almost anything. Okay, if you could write it, I will uh, read it for everyone. That will be better, I think. OK, we have a um, question from Paul Court. Brother Paul, floor is yours. Okay, you Hi, um, uh, Brother Cooper. Thank you very, very much. I, I cannot say that I ever leave a lecture that you give not happy and not wiser. <laughs> so thank you very, very much uh, for what you impart. Uh, thank you, Brother David, uh, for being the one who has, you know, been keeping this all together. Really, really grateful. Now, Brother Cooper, my question is uh, simple. Now, you mentioned that at the founding of the Grand Lodge, there were many lodges that did not uh, come under the jurisdiction of the Grand Lodge for one reason or another. Um, my question is, um, are there lodges? that have since refused to affiliate and they're just free hanging bodies, like freelance uh, journalists, et cetera, et cetera, uh, existing like that? Or um, is it the custom that every single one of the lodges existing now in Scotland has come under some grand body or authority? Yeah, um, no, there's no sort of independent lodges anymore. Um, part of the reason it goes back to the Secret Societies Act or whatever it was called, Unf Unlawful Societies Act, where the government said uh, to be a legitimate organization, you have to be under a Grand Lodge. So if you were not under a Grand Lodge, you would have been, uh, you would have been considered unlawful, seditious, and you would have been as suppressed by the by the government. Um, the other reason, of course, is that I mean there is no there's no monopoly on Freemasonry. I mean you could find, you could found a grand lo uh, a lodge. Sorry, you could found a, a Masonic lodge um, here in Scotland, not under the Grand Lodge of Scotland. But the problem with that, of course, is you wouldn't get any visitors because it would not be a recognised lodge and nobody would come near you. 
So in order to survive um, as a Masonic Lodge, you have to be under the Grand Lodge of Scotland, either here or overseas. Okay, thank you. Answers uh, taken. There is a question from Brother Hasso. Does the obligations in each degree remain the same in all rituals? Or at least to the extent uh, you know? No, it's very different. It, again, because it's part of the ritual, the, obligate, the wording of the obligation can be different from lodge to lodge. Having said that, it tends to be very similar. Um, so in Edinburgh, they are pretty much the same, but if you go further afield, there, you, you begin to notice differences. Um, but yeah, uh, again, it, without visiting a lot of lodges, you'll not notice the differences. That's the problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, there were very interesting remarks and anyone who wants to save the chat for uh, later uh, checkup, please do so. It is available for you. Uh, unfortunately, due timing and a lot of uh, uh, remarks, I won't be able to read all of them. I'll skip all, uh, some of them, but many, most of them are in public. So uh, uh, you just can uh, get very good idea about my, about Huza, where it comes from. Uh, Brother Jacques shared some, uh, some uh, references. And also Brother David uh, Waddington uh, shared, checked up in the dictionary, and it is an uh, English word. And there are some other uh, remarks which are quite interesting for those who want to check them up and save for future. Uh, so uh, I'll read the question uh, that comes from David Waddington. Observation for comment by Brother Robert. I was fascinated by how different versions of Freemasonry propagated and developed on the American continent. To hear from you how it happened in Scotland is very interesting indeed. I noticed that the lodges seem to have taken their names from the towns or villages of origin, but wonder how the various lodges may have influenced by the Scottish clan system. Also, was Scottish Freemasonry active in the development of Freemasonry in Ulster? Thanks again for another informative lecture and discussion. So, Scottish clans, do they have any influence on naming or any kind of uh, structure? And what about Freemasonry in Ulster? Um, tracing the connection with, with clans is not something I don't think that's been researched in any detail. What I can say is that um, some lodges, uh, and I'm thinking about the one, of course, the clan system existed in the Highlands, uh, the Lowlands, not so much. Um, there are some lodges that, that have a, a very direct connection to some specific clans, but I think that, I don't think it was influenced by the clan system. I think the clan said, we want our lodge. And that, the reason for that is that the lo lo lodges already existed in the Lowlands, and only later um, became involved in the clan homelands, if you like. And you can see that from a map of the early lodges where the highlands of Scotland has um, virtually no lodges at all. And that's simply because the culture was completely different. Um, and you've got to remember, I think, that because of the connection to the guilds, originally, guilds only existed in towns right and the lodge was connected to the guild now in the highlands uh, the clan system was essentially agrarian um they lived on the land and there were very very few towns at all so there was no guilds in those part of the world in, in that part of scotland and therefore no lodges connected to anything so that's why there was no lodges connected to clans as such um and in Ulster, um, we know uh, that in the time of William Shaw, um, lots of Scots were transplanted. It's called, um, I can't remember, there is a, there is a, a term for it. Uh, James the uh, Sixth of Scotland, later James the First of Britain, um, James the Sixth transplanted lots of Scottish Protestants 
um, into what is now Ulster or Northern Ireland, um, essentially um, stealing the land from the, the native population um, who were a, a, a different um, a religion, not a different religion, different faith. And this was an attempt in their way of thinking to pacify Ireland or um, some would say to um, make them more culturally acceptable. I'm trying to find the correct words here. But yes, the transplantation or the, the, the large number of Protestants who were taken from Scotland and um, delivered into Ireland um, must have had an effect because um, a lot of these people were members of lodges. That has never been researched and I don't think there's any kind of documentary evidence to study, but one's got to suspect there was some kind of an impact, certainly in, in the northern part of Ireland. But other than that, and I'm not making any religious or political points here, it's simply a matter of uh, historical fact that that's what happened. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brother Hasso is asking, so does it mean that uh, Grand Lodge of Scotland was the only Grand Lodge, unlike England, where there were two Grand Lodges asserting their rights to be the legitimate representatives until 1813? So was there just only uh, initiative and that kind of uh, is what you have? Yes, we've only ever had one Grand Lodge here, um, uh, not two. And that's, I mean, <laughs> some people <laughs> would say that the United Grand Lodge of England was not founded uh, in 1717. It was founded in 1813 when the two lodges, the two Grand Lodges came together. And so the Grand Lodge, the present Grand Lodge of England only dates from 1813. But that's, that's um, so an observation on which I will not comment. All right, uh, just uh, for recording purposes, uh, Brother Dimitrios Contesis shared that Alexander Drummond, Scottish Freemason, found lodges in the East, Syria, Turkey, etc., in 1750s. Just for the recording and the, for the viewers of this. Uh, uh, yeah, it was actually 1739 in, in Syria. Actually, 1739. Sorry, my little yeah. dog is. <laughs> it's tell, telling you it's hungry. No. Where's my food? Yeah, well, my, my wife is already feeding them and the two are competing. <laughs> David, David's got his dog, David Walling. All right. Are, uh, are, are we going to have a Zoom meeting of dogs now? That would be an interesting <laughs> idea. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm just trying to uh, run through the... Re the remaining comments, not just to check in, just checking if there are any questions. Okay, just uh, no, Brother see. Howard Barrett said it would be appreciated if a copy of the Mark Degree Tracing Board could be shared also with ritual. Could that be done? Uh, only? If I can find if, if I can find it, um, yes. I know I've got, I have one in the garage. Unfortunately, my son's ancient but much loved vehicle has been parked there for about 16 years. And there's some bits in the garage I can't reach. I think it's actually in the seal, in, in the, in the kind of attic of the garage. But I'll have a look, I'll have a look. Um, okay. And somebody was at, some, you know, the, 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 the Scots that went to Ulster Ken, Ken McGimsty's up in the chat room has said it was called the plantation. Thanks very much for that. You're absolutely right. I couldn't remember. So the plantation was the scheme where lots of Scots were sent over to Ireland. Okay, thank you. Um, Brother Hasu was asking, is the Mark degree the same as practiced under the Mark Masons in England or does the ritual differ? It differs, right? Yeah. Of course, <laughs> yes, it differs. Um, uh, something that's never been uh, really researched is that the Mark degree um, well, was two points to make. Firstly, the Mark degree consisted of two parts: the Mark, the Mark Master, and the Mark Mason. 
Mark Mason came first, the Mark Master was, a, was the second part. The other thing is that um, the Mark degree didn't exist in England and it was um, imported there um, by a Royal Arts chapter of all things uh, called Bon Accord from Aberdeen. So the Royal Arts chapter, Bon Accord in Aberdeen, um, formed Mark lodges um, in England, particularly in places like Lancashire. Um, and that gave rise to the existing um, Grand Lord of Mark Master Masons. I um, can't remember the date. But uh, so that was a Scottish importation into England, if you like. Okay, thank you. Uh, MMM, I guess it, it's exactly the tracing board uh, that was shared by Jacques in public chat. So anyone who wants to look or download it, please do so. I'll open it for public. Uh, Brother Jacques, is it okay to show it on public, to uh, have it on the, on the recording? Yes, just don't discuss it, just show it. Yes, yes, without discussion, just uh, for the recording because we have the viewers. Okay, I'll share it for yeah. a second and that's it. Yeah, that's it, that's it, that's exactly it. It's, uh, there's a couple of variations on it, but that's pretty much it. Okay, so this is the one that we've been uh, discussing and the copy is here if anyone wants to download, including Aubrey, you got it right in a few minutes after your request. See, it's after how the works, fine. <laughs> All right. so I've got, I got it, thank you very much. What I'm interested in is, is the lecture that's attached to it, bro. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sure. Uh, Aubrey, Aubrey, if you Google, if you Google, Google Mark Master Tracing Board Lecture, and you'll find it. All right. All right. Let's see what happens. Or I don't. Or I don't know. I found a lecture that was that they said was the Mark Master Tracing Board. It's not a degree I have, so I can't verify. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jacques, uh, for sharing that file. Excellent. Uh, there are some thank yous, and I guess uh, we are at the end of this uh, session. I'll just check uh, with if if there is any question. Yeah, there is one question. Mm, uh, actually, the the London there is a comment which I would read for recording purposes. Uh, the London uh, Library companies are the direct descendants of the earlier guilds and are in enmity with trades houses. Uh, incorporation in Glasgow, although there are many masons in both, neither is Masonic. That's tracing, uh, okay, and uh, regarding tracing board, that's the tracing board that was used in the Edinburgh Lodge I visited. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, kind of uh, confirmed also from, uh, from a brother yeah. who's viewing us on, uh, watching us on YouTube. And the question is, uh, from Graham Sarden, um, was there any echoes in the guilds from Dal Raida, or was there a complete separation? Dal Riada, Dal Raida. I don't know how to pronounce it. You probably know what he's talking about. Um, is that another another um, uh, definition of Scotland? Dalradia, Dalradia. I, I don't know. I just read the. I just read the question. Uh, was there any echoes in the guilds from Dalraida? Could you type that into the chat room so I can yes, see? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that exactly right now, so you can. Everybody can read it. That's the question from YouTube. I don't know. I don't know what that is to be honest okay okay brother oh, graham familiar. if you can uh can you rephrase your question we'll be happy ah, to right yes it's, it's 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 all one it's all one word um it's uh oh that was, was an ancient kingdom in county yeah entrim yeah 
Yeah, the west coast of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, but you know, you're going you're going way way back before um, uh, before uh, Lord, before written records. In fact, it's the sixth and seventh century. That was a, it was it was the kingdom of Dalradia, uh, which is all one word, and uh, it was a Gaelic kingdom that had west of Scotland, also known as the Kingdom of the Isles, because it was mainly the islands off the west coast of Scotland. So the Kingdom of the Isles, um, but it's the sixth and seventh century, which is hundreds of years before any written records exist. Um, and probably therefore, because it, it's an agrarian society, no guilds existed at that time in Scotland. Okay, that should be it. Uh, yes, uh, he made a yeah, Gaelic uh, kingdom in uh, Northeast Ireland and west coast of Scotland. Yeah, uh, yeah, no worries. Okay, anyway, we answered your question uh, to the extent we could. And I think uh, then uh, we've been around two hours and 20 minutes right now. So uh, I'll call for final remarks on or questions, if any, there, and then we conclude the meeting. If there is anything you want to ask Brother Bob uh, during this session, please take the floor. Otherwise, Brother Bob, uh, maybe final remarks or your recommendations regarding anything you want to leave for this particular uh, lecture, and I'll I'll wrap up the. Lecture. I think I've talked enough. <laughs> okay. Again, then, um, thank you so much. Uh, huge gratitude, uh, sincerely, for your time, for your, um, may I say, bottomless uh, knowledge, uh, bottomless pot of knowledge. Uh, it's kind of very Georgian oh. expression. <laughs> when there is no bottom, you go deeper, deeper, and there is always knowledge. So, Thank you for uh, for being like that and for sharing a, so much uh, of interesting part of the history. And um, uh, thank you for uh, being with us on Sapere Aude tonight. Uh, once again, I'll remind everyone that today we had Sapere Aude in number 79 on foundation of the Grand Lodge of Scotland with the world-renowned Masonic historian, brother Robert Cooper. Uh, and that uh, concludes our lecture on 13th of September 2020.